Ruby has long been a very introspective and dynamic language that, to a great extent, lets you dig into its inner workings on the fly if you so wish. In my Ruby Reloaded course, one of the things that tended to surprise people was to learn about something called set trace funk, which, as the name implies, can be used to trace the execution of a Ruby program by way of a function. And it's so much part of Ruby's innards, the inner core, that it gets a mere four-line mention in Max's own The Ruby Programming Language book. So, here's how set trace funk works. It's a kernel method, so you can use it anywhere, as we have here on line 7. But before we call it, we need to actually give it a tracer function. So that's what I've defined here in a lambda, um, on these first several lines here. And when a tracer function is called, it's passed several arguments that come in as parameters, which I've named event, file, line, very self-descriptive things. I then choose certain parts of those to display, and then use a nice formatting string so that it will print everything out in a very nice way. So we turn the tracer on, very simple, and if I run this code, nothing will happen. Um, very boring. However, if we actually do something interesting, like this code at the bottom, which what it does is it just creates a class with a very simple method, creates an instance of that class, and then calls that method. Now our tracer function has been called lots and lots of times, and this line 4 has been run equally number of times. Well, some of this stuff is really boring, but the interesting parts are the parts that let you see behind the scenes of what MRI is actually doing. So, for example, when we create our class here on line 9, behind the scenes, the inherited hook method within Ruby is called. More interesting, though, is down on line 15, where we actually create and initialize our object, and then we call the my method down here. Um, so we get to see the call, the actual line of code that's run, which is just 42, and the return down here. So the output is very verbose, but set trace funk essentially gets MRI to call our lambda every time various things of interest occur, um, such as calling and returning from methods. Now we get to the good stuff. Trace point is a more object-oriented Ruby 2.0 equivalent of set trace funk, and essentially makes it defunct. Defunct? Get it? Okay, we'll give up my day job. Uh, without dwelling on my bad sense of humor too much, here's the trace point equivalent of our set trace funk experiment from before. It doesn't look significantly different, does it? Note, however, that we explicitly enable the tracer here, which also means that we can disable it too. Very, very simple. Um, so we could enable it around one piece of code only. Um, you could do this with set trace func by passing it with no arguments to turn it off, but the API wasn't as nice. And it's also possible to call it in an imperative way, like with set trace func using tracepoint.trace like so, um, rather than tracepoint.new, and that will run the uh, tracer immediately and straight away. Just uh, one of the other things to notice about this is that instead of getting tons of different parameters, we have a single one, which is this TP, which is a tracepoint object um, that has various methods on it, which we use here um, to get very similar results to what we did with setTraceFunk. So tracepoint has a better API, but how else is it better than setTraceFunk? Oh, let me count the ways. You can give tracepoint's enable method a block, as we can see here on lines 15 to 17, so that the tracer is only run on a certain piece of code and you don't have to explicitly disable it. You may recognize this pattern from file reading, for example. If I run this code, you can now see a lot simpler trace than before. It's also possible to check whether a tracer is disabled or enabled. Very simple methods to do that, enabled, disabled. We can also get a tracer to only respond to certain types of events. So in this example, we tell TracePoint we only want to see return events. So that is extremely simple and will only show us when we come back from the my method, shows us nothing else. And because TracePoint is object oriented and no longer a single global trace function, another thing you can do is have multiple tracers, as shown here. So I've created a tracers array and then I just pass in different tracers to it, one for return, one for call, I could do lots of other ones if I wanted to, but all I do is I just print out various things for those traces. And one thing I do down here is I call the my method three times. If I go in and have a look, you can see the call return, call return, call return. Very cool. Another thing that TracePoint does that I think is really cool is it allows us to grab hold of return values on return events. So in this example where we had the event coming back from the method, what if we want to access and find out what that return value is? We can. It tells us it's 42. This gives us a really interesting um, amount of introspection into what the program is doing. Another thing that we can do 
And it was possible to do this with set trace func in a slightly ugly way. This is just a nicer API. We can grab hold of the object that's relevant to the trace in a more direct fashion. So let's see what that means. It means we actually grab back the instance that we're talking about. So that's the instance of my class that we're referring to and calling the my method upon. So why would this be useful? Well, for most developers it won't be, but if you like living on the edge, this could be an interesting way to see if a method returns consistent answers, uh, for example. So here's a really horrible example for you. This line of code is the real key one here. What it will do is, is it will find out what method has been you know, called and we're now returning from. It will call it again and it will see whether that value on the second call matches up with the value from the first call. So let's just run this code and it tells us same result because it's going to return 42 every time whatever happens. If however I make the method return a random value, we get different result coming up because what happens on the second call does not match up with what happened on the first call, or at least there's a 1 in 42 chance that it might. So I'll leave it to you to determine the long-term weaknesses in this plan, um, but it involves getting hold of the parameters that the method was called with. Let you work on that one. Last but not least, trace point is also faster as it doesn't create temporary objects by default every single time the tracer function is run. We played with the basic return event before, but trace point supports many others and these are mostly the same things that set trace func did, but with few extras uh, like checking that threads have begun and ended, for example. So the main things here, as you can see, are you know, it's, has, a, has a line been run? Has a class or a module definition been opened or closed? Has a method been called or returned from? Has a C method or C function had been called and returned from? Uh, has an exception been raised? So this is another way that you could check exceptions throughout an entire application. So if you were trying to build some kind of exception tracker, trace point may be the thing for you. Um, and also whether a block has been entered um, or left. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this tour into a very interesting, tiny piece of the uh, Ruby 2.0 innards.